Here's your note. Coming in hot. All right. So welcome to Conversations on Social Issues. My name is Kimberly Tate Malone, and I'm one of the reference and instruction librarians at Seattle Central College. We are so happy that you chose to join us today. I know there are lots of things you could be doing. So I'd like to start with our land and labor acknowledgements. So on behalf of Seattle Central College, I acknowledge the unceded land on which we stand or sit today as the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering and dialogue. If you don't know, land acknowledgement is a traditional custom dating back many centuries for many native tribes and nations. And we thereby express our gratitude and honor and respect for the indigenous peoples on the land we live and work. If you do not happen to be in the greater Seattle area, I'm so sorry, Shamsa. Can other people hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, if you do not happen to be in the greater Seattle area, I'm posting some links in the chat. You can click that first link to find out the um, let whose land you are on. You can also say, sign the petition to restore federal acknowledgement to the Duwamish tribe, and you can consider paying real rent to the Duwamish. So we also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which this country, state, and institution are built. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped um, and brought to the U.S. from the African continent, particularly West Africa and recognize the continued con contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor and immigrant labor um, and the folks who have contributed to the building of this country. So in the library, we hold this series every week because we want to learn from the expertise, experiences, um, and brilliance of our community members. That means faculty, staff, students. I'm already planning the schedule for next quarter. If you are passionate about a topic and want to share, feel free to um, email me. And next week, we'll be having Fern Renville, who will be leading a session on the indigenous roots and future of American democracy. That'll be in your inbox soon, I'm sure. Um, but today, I am so pleased to have our Dean of Student Development at Seattle Central College, Ricardo Leva Puebla, who will be leading this session titled, I Have a Complaint. So without further ado, I'm turning it over to you, Ricardo. Great, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and turn on my PowerPoint, share it. Oh. <clears throat> Bear with me a second. And there we go. Thumbs up if people can see it okay. All right, good. Well, um, thank you all for participating in today's conversation and discussion and information sharing. Um, as, uh, as you heard, my name is Ricardo Leiva Puebla and I'm the Dean of Student Development at Seattle Central. I've been working for the district for over 10 years now. Um, I'm losing track of time, uh, but I um, began working for the district at, and I was uh, located at South Seattle College as the director for their um, EDI, their uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Department. So um, and prior to that, I've been around for a bit um, in both the community college and four-year and colleges and university in the state and out of state uh, in California. So lots of experience um, and believe it or not, um, <laughs> I kind of like this part of my job. Uh, it's, it's hard and is um, sometimes challenging as it is because um, I see it as a learning opportunity for everybody involved. So we'll be talking about um, our complaints process. Hopefully I can move forward on the PowerPoint and there it goes. Um, so the idea here is to share the existing student, you know, it, mechanisms that students have to, to help problem solve some of these issues that come up. So the who, the how, where, and the why, and I would add the what in there for students' complaints process. Um, so that's what we're gonna sort of cover throughout. I do appreciate questions. Um, if the information will be shared uh, at a later time, if you have a question that is, and 
the information will be shared. I, I might wait and say, uh, this is coming up, I'll answer it then. Or, but I do like it, um, Q and A throughout the process. Um, that way I don't hear myself talking all the time and get a little uncomfortable listening to myself too for too long. So that's what we're hoping um, to talk about and share and have conversations around. So there's a poll that we'd like for you to engage with right now. And that is the, um, from uh, speaking for yourself, um, how, um, you know, answer the question. I know how to go about filing a complaint using the student's complaints process. Is um, yes or no? And so the poll is up. And if um, you can answer those questions, um, that'll give me an idea of where we are in, in the knowledge of information here. So great. So the no's are having, uh, having it here, it looks like. Um, great, so I'm hoping that by the end of this process, you'll have that information at hand and have a little bit um, deeper understanding of how to go about this. Uh, for those of you who um, answered you do know, um, please share your experience if you have it at the appropriate times as it comes up in the conversation. Um, and um, throughout the time, one of the things that I do will that I do want to have happen is if you have um, ideas or thoughts about how to improve in the process um, or uh, tips that you can share that were useful for other folks, um, for the, especially for those of you who, who have the yeses on, on this, uh, that would be great. Um, and so we can share and, and um, do a little comparison here every now and then. All right, thank you for that. Um, so what is this complaints process? Um, it is, uh, you know, complaints are a statement, uh, situation, you know, something has gone aw awry um, and you want to figure out how to address it with someone, uh, basically, right? Um, I have a complaint and I need to share it with somebody or tell somebody, let somebody know that uh, something is, not quite gone to you know the way that I thought it should go. So that's sort of the uh, dic dictionary uh, definition. Um, the complaints process itself is a, um, a state regulated. There are some steps, there are some rules that we have to follow um, that is time, uh, length, uh, and details and information and who's responsible, et cetera. So in their definition, this is the one that um, I would like for you to, to think about more deeply when it comes to complaints process. So it's a grievance it, um, and it's a good faith. And, and this in the brackets, it's my own addition to, to what the WAC says is, you know, honest and sincere intention. So something, some grievance, something has gone uh, not well for me and I, I have a complaint, an allegation based on personal experience or knowledge um, by a student, uh, and this is for students uh, and by students, that there has been a violation, a misapplication, a misinterpretation of some service or rule as it applies to students in the institution by a staff or faculty member of the institution resulting in loss or detriment to, my, to, my, um, to me as an individual. Does that make sense? So um, what I'd like for you to do is I'm gonna hold a little bit of silence and, and have you read that on your own again and um, just reflect on it for a minute or less than a minute. I'll give you a few seconds here. Great. So what I'd like for you to do on the chat, a word or two or a phrase, uh, and I'll say go, <laughs> that resonates or you go, you know, it makes you go, hmm, or you think you'd want more information. So if it makes you go, hmm, you put a little, a little, um, 
asterisk next to the word or phrase. If it's, uh, it makes you want more information, put a little question mark next to the word or phrases, all right? Um, so we'll go with those two pieces so on the chat. Now you can go and write a couple of phrases, words or, or phrase, a couple of words or phrase, and something that makes you go, hmm, uh, you know, the, or you have a question about something that makes you ponder with a little asterisk next to it, to the word or phrase and a question mark if it's a question that you have more about it. So go ahead and do that. And, um, and as Kimberly's looking at those chats, What are we seeing there, Kimberly? So we have folks noting that it's tricky to define good faith, right? Another good faith, um, this is my comment, by a staff or faculty member, question mark, student or students, asterisk, um, personal experience, made someone go, hmm, service or rule with a question, allegation or intention, Someone noting by staff or faculty, can it be a system? Question mark. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Yeah, quite broad, right? And that's the interesting thing about this definition that it, there's a lot more questions, I think, that it raises sometimes um, than it creates answers to. Um, but on the sort of the, 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 pardon me going to close the one thing here, but the good faith is, you know, we're sincere and honest about, I have felt something has gone awry. And so, and it could be the system that has created it, um, in which case, you know, who is the person that you complain against, right? Um, and, and as we go through the process of explaining the complaints process, it will have an answer to that. Um, but keep those and questions in mind. And let's see if maybe in this presentation, you, there's an answer to it. If not, let's come back to it at the end. So, um, let's go back to the, so the, you know, the why is like, so a conflict, a disagreement, a misunderstanding, a miscommunication, any and more of those things can cause uh, that, you know, turning on of that complaints process. Um, and it also, the why is because it's the resource for students to access. So that student or students piece, this process is the only process available to students formally, like in the books on, on as part of our RCWs that is given to students for a complaint that is not related to other kinds of issues that um, arise that are not part of the complaints process. And we'll talk a little bit more um, about those. Um, so uh, the, the who, it serves the student. So this, this is the assist, it assists the student in navigating, you know, both the formal and informal complaints process. And that gives you a little clue that there are two steps or two different possibilities here when it comes to complaints. Um, it, the, the piece around um, the complaints process is that the, the hope is that there is some way of resolving the issue. Um, it also benefits indirectly the, the faculty and staff because it provides a, a guideline that the students can use uh, individually. And that we then as staff and faculty can say, there is a process. Um, faculty have the union, they have their um, contract. There's a lot of supporting systems that is available to, to them as individuals. Um, staff, uh, if they're classified, they have you know, their classification and the union representation, um, if you are pro uh, 
staff uh, union or classified. There are those pieces. The, the students don't have necessarily a union or a document except for this is it. And so this is what the students can use and do use when there is this, you know, concern that they have that there's been some kind of violation um, uh, in a process or even a system uh, that someone has maybe not done something. And then again, it could be because of miscommunication. It could be because of misunderstanding. It could just be, you know, style sometimes. Uh, and, um, and misunderstanding obviously can oftentimes create conflict and, and resulting in. Um, so there are three campuses, and um, I know that there are maybe possible individuals here from other of the other campuses, the North and South. Um, so each of the campuses have their own designee, at least for now. Um, uh, and those are, uh, you have uh, Mari, uh, Dr. Mari Jacob Nash at uh, North, and you have uh, Dan Johnson or, uh, and then myself, here at Central. Um, the, the individuals, if, if the individuals are not um, on the campus at times, you know, we give the responsibility to somebody else um, to kind of back us up. But the, we three are the ones that, that um, are having this uh, responsibility. Uh, and we're the designated. And that's one of the rules that the state is saying, that the state requires each campus across the 30 plus community and technical colleges to have somebody designated to listen to and hear the uh, complaints um, that the students bring. So um, the other piece of the how is, and this is where I was sort of speaking to earlier, is that there is an informal process. So as the student has a concern or an issue with an individual, there are, if it's a sexual harassment issue, then that goes to human resource. The complaints process is not intended to address any of those kinds of issues. If it's a burst, a bias incident report, there is the burst uh, process through the EDI office uh, that the students can go through. Uh, if it's a conduct issue, they do not use this complaints process. They, that goes through the conduct issue um, and the officer there. Um, and that's through the vice president for student services office. Uh, but if there are general concerns, personal experience, grade, um, you know, classroom stuff, um, office, when I've gone to an office and there's been some issue there, um, a department, uh, a service, something that has not gone, I then would receive, my office would receive that, that um, call or email um, with this complaint. That's where it comes to me. I, uh, the step is, of course, to have a conversation with the individuals. And that's part of the informal process. All the students are encouraged when there is a conflict to first address them with the individual who you have that conflict with. Um, it's you know part of the course. Anytime we have a conflict, we wanna address it directly with the individual. So that's the informal, right? If that oftentimes, gets resolved right away. Um, sometimes students don't recognize or realize that they can truly go to the faculty, they can go to that staff and have that conversation um, and resolve it. Um, believe it or not, it, you know, it's, it can be a little daunting for folks, uh, especially some of us who hate conflict uh, naturally and our go-to is, uh, do I need to talk? So. The other piece around this conversation is that you could always reach out to my office or other people on campus. So for example, if you're a TRIO student and you have two advisors, um, invite them and say, you know, I'm a little worried about having this conversation. Can you come and help me out um, and be my support system? Uh, Ricardo, I don't know how to approach this. Can you help me walk through or sort through this so that I can have a better conversation and trying to find res res resolution around this. Um, it is a transparent, it's supposed to be a uh, transparent process. Um, students can come for that conversation and that remains just our conversation at that time because it's informal. We're just trying to figure it out. You know, We're trying to find a way to a solution 
Um, and I find that that takes care of a lot of our uh, in, you know, conflicts that, or issues that the complaints process um, sort of gets um, in, involved with. Um, so if that's the case, then it gets concluded. But if not, the conversation then we ask that you have with the supervisor of that individual. So the reason we, we ask that is for a couple of reasons. One, um, the supervisor knows that staff well and can support and coach that staff or faculty uh, in helping them find resources or support themselves, get some support from the supervisor on how to manage and work with the student. Um, and it's also good because then that way the supervisor is aware of what's going on in the, in, in the area. And if there's knowledge and information that they can acquire uh, about how to best support and address those issues, that's the sort of the, the informal process that we ask all students to, to go through. So if that's resolved, then that's concluded. However, if it isn't, that's where the formal process begins. And what I'm sharing with you, <coughs> excuse me, is across the three campuses. This is how we work with students and work with departments. The idea here is, is to try to learn as much as we can in the informal process to take care of any of those conflicts and issues. Um, and even when it goes to the formal process, so you the student has talked to the individual and the responses and results have not been amicable. They've talked to the supervisor and that has not brought forth um, you know, a, a outcome that is satisfactory either. Then this formal um, process uh, can take place. Um, and there are steps that that formal process needs to take. A letter of complaint, a formal, and this is a formal process. So, um, you know, there is a, you have, the documentation has to be there. Um, and, you know, you one has to describe the nature of the complaint, describe the action, that the student has taken. So all of those conversations and emails that the student might have had uh, back and forth and trying to resolve, demonstrating that the student has in good faith uh, attempted to resolve the issue, um, describe the solution that they seek. So what, what is the complaint, the outcome of the complaint that the student wants? Um, that's an important piece. Um, and it's very important because clarity about what it is that the student is wanting to get out of this complaint, oftentimes the lack of clarity is what creates that you know, further conflict. Um, but having clarity about what it is that they want helps everybody involved, right? Uh, even before it becomes formal, but that's really an important piece when it's the, the formal process. Um, and then provide details, dates, times, and documentation about this. So, so this is going back to, to the letter of complaint, it has to have all of those pieces to it. Um, and then if, and there are timelines, by the way. So once that is submitted to my office, I have a limited time to make sure that I write a letter to the faculty or staff whose complaint it is against indicating this is the materials that have been submitted, this is the complaint, and this is what the individual student's asking. Um, and it goes to the, to the individual who complaint again, who is against, along with to their supervisor. And then they have, um, the individual has time limit to respond to this. It's usually 10 days. They respond. I then receive that response uh, and then share that with the student. If the student's satisfied, then we're done. We've completed that process. But if that result of that, uh, the response res doesn't result in anything that the student um, is, had wanted to see happen, they can then request a conference. And the conference then involves the student, the person who is complained against, the supervisor, and myself. Now at any time here, if it's a faculty or a staff, they can choose to have, and I've seen this happen where they want union representation and that individual is there. 
the student could have somebody there to support them as well. And I've seen that as, uh, as well, that the student has somebody just as a support system. I'm there in the conference and I facilitate that process. At the end of that, I provide a report with hopefully some suggestion and solution. But again, if that's not satisfactory, the student has one final step and that's an appeal to the vice president, whether of instruction or student services or administration, whoever the, the VP is, has then the final decision and that's the end of the process. Ricardo, we have a question in the chat about um, a student to student complaint. Does it go through the same process? Or is there something else? Student, depending again on what the nature of that is, um, it could, if depending on the nature of it, it could be conduct, right? This particular process is really intended in, as an institution, right? for us to address a student's complaint. But if it's a student to student, depending on what the issue is, that the, they may need to, the student may need to try the other um, avenues. Um, so it really depends. So part of the connecting with our office is trying to find at what, you know, what level does that. If it's behavioral, something that the student has done, conduct would be the, uh, the you know the steps to take and you can file a you know a contact issue against another student thank you for that and another question um asking what about a complaint regarding a department or process rather than an individual then um if if it's a department find out who the director of that department is to address that issue um and then if that doesn't work go to their supervisor at which point if neither of those two issues find a solution, then by all means, file a formal complaint. And you can file it against a department, which will then the director or person responsible for that area will be the one to, um, to have to address. Thank you. Yeah, good question though. Got to put those on my frequent asked questions stuff. Um, I'm updating or um, um, yes, trying working on updating our web page so that it has a lot more information and resources for both faculty, staff, and students. Other questions before I move on? Um, we have a question from Caroline um, saying, is there a way for general feedback or suggestion to happen as opposed to a complaint or grievance? Uh, there is. There are a couple of ways to, to for general. One is through your student uh, government. So the student government um, for those of you who don't participate or attend the student government meetings, I encourage you to attend at least one a quarter. Um, at the beginning of those, there's uh, opportunity for comments. So please let your, your official student body government know of issues that come up because they have the ear to the ground and also the uh, co connection with the president and the Councils, uh, college council in so many different ways and they can speak to and they also have um, access to administration, etc. So through the student government uh, and at Central, we have issues and concerns executive officer, you can share with them and you're welcome to always send um, information to myself and um, the vice president of student services because um, they can keep track of what issues and comments come up that um, that need to be addressed, um, especially. Thank you. I have two more questions in the chat. One from Paul saying, one significant issue has been past deans skipping the process or accelerating the complaint forward or toward the more formal process. In other words, how could we protect from supervisor or dean abuse? Yeah, and um, it, during my tenure, um, I, tend to go the other way. <laughs> um, it's a little tricky um, in that a formal complaint is what triggers, especially for faculty, right? Because of, con uh, because of the contract and the union. A formal complaint is what triggers the activity. However, a student can informally be talking with any one of us 
And to me, that's not formal. So it doesn't, that's not triggering the formal process as of yet. The tricky part is that sometimes a student believes that they have started a formal complaint when they actually haven't because they haven't done what is in this particular slide. They haven't done the, the description, they haven't formally submitted a, a letter of complaint um, or filed um, north and south, and we have it at Central too, but I tend to use a written uh, document that can be emailed or um, uh, hard copy submitted. Um, there's also a, a link to a um, electronic version as well, but that has to happen. Um, that's the what that's what makes it official. Uh, sometimes students think that just by having a conversation they've started the process, but that's not the process. A conversation is just that until we, um, until we receive um, the you know a formal written document, um, then that's when we take on. Um, but informally there could be conversations taking place. Sometimes it feels like it is formal because, you know, it's personally speaking, and I know that um, my fellow staff and faculty experience this, it's not easy to hear that somebody has filed a formal complaint or has a complaint about me or anyone else has a complaint, you know, or somebody has a complaint about anybody else. It's not easy, it doesn't feel good. I take, I, as the officer, I come from the place of it's information and it's about learning. Um, and this, um, again, good faith, it's really about communicating. You know, we talk about creating a community where we can engage and trying to resolve conflict and, you know, sometimes speak a hard truth um, at times. And we need to be sort of in that space of being able to receive it and uh, and listen. And those are difficult things to do, especially, I know for me. Um, I mean, I don't wanna do harm to anyone. Um, I don't wanna do wrong, but I'm sure that there are times that I will and have made mistakes um, and or done what I could have done differently. I you know could have done better. And those are not, it doesn't feel good. So, um, but, the intent here is to communicate. Um, so when it comes to um, this sense that circumvents, the student can actually, they have the right to do formal. Um, it is their responsibility, the, the excuse me, it is their um, um, RCW, it is the, the, the regulated process that they have and they can make use of it. Just like we experience um, staff and faculty that go from you know, zero to 10, uh, I've seen it, um, that can happen, uh, but we hope that people will take those informal steps before getting to that formal. Um, to uh, again, answer the question, in my experience, there's very far and few in between are those steps where somebody goes to zero to 10 right away. Uh, but it does happen, and it, I would say that I try really hard to to get students to do that informal process because that can end in a good positive uh, results. Paul is saying thanks for the response and thank goodness for supportive unions. Yes, all right. Benito also has a question. Um, if Is there ever a situation that an informal complaint can or would be turned into a formal complaint without a request by the individual lodging the complaint? No. No. If I understand the question is, can, can there be a formal complaint without the person making that step themselves? I, no. No. That it's not possible for somebody to take up a complaint that isn't their own or, yeah, it's not doable. I can't imagine, yeah, no, <laughs> because then, so imagine, um, let's just use this. So if I decide to go forward with a complaint that a student has not officially filed, it would make it difficult for me to move forward in that process. 
knowing that I have to submit letter, I have to submit documentation um, and dates and time and be clear about the, the what the ask um, and, and represent the individual in doing that. I mean, that, oof, imagine the trouble that I would be in if I'm speaking on behalf of somebody else. Uh, and producing and providing all of that information. I just don't see it as a possibility. Um, yeah, I can't. Thanks, Ricardo. And Henock is um, in the chat saying, um, how resolution that you, that this person might be seeking to take, um, how do you detail in an informal com complaint, um, dates, time, witnesses, past deans may have skipped accelerating the complaint towards your your information Henock, um would you like to to um speak speak on your chat chat comment yeah sure how do you how do the illustration for like like information data witness co co information hmm So how do you, are you asking how, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm, I think I'm having a little bit of trouble. Um, are you asking how you would seek resolution without having all that information? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, if the, if you're, let's use, use an example. So if you're um, having an experience in which you have a complaint about, you're the one most likely they will have all of the resources available to you to address that complaint. So let's say that you came into uh, our area. I, my office is on the third floor uh, about the bookstore of the Student Leadership Building. Um, so let's say that you come onto, camp, onto our campus at Central and you go up to the third floor of the Student um, Leadership Building, our students, um, you go up to the front office and I'm there um, welcoming and I do, or prevent you from obtaining some information, or you feel like, you know, I've done something wrong uh, that has in, in um, prevented you from receiving the fullness of service that you believe that you should have received. Um, and you're, it's off putting to you. You're not satisfied with that. Uh, the informal process, now you have experienced, you have experienced me, having a conversation with you, you're not having received what you were hoping to, um, then your next step would be to have that conversation with me about, excuse me, I'm, you know, but this is my experience. And so we engage informally in this process of trying to find a solution to the issue. Um, so right there, you and I have had that experience, you have all of the information. So if from that point forward, it's still not working out and you try talking to other people in the office, it's still not being resolved and it goes on. You're, you are the one that has the experience, the date and the um, situation that you could write down and provide. Um, on my end, I can remember you being there and I can respond to that. So the information is at your uh, hands and in your experience that you can address and, and write about. Um, other ways are students email back and forth uh, departments. Um, students have um, materials uh, and information through communication that they have that they can submit if it becomes form a formal process. Those are the kinds of documents that you uh, would need to have. Um, and I can also help coach students in regards to creating a table of dates, experience, and um, what that student uh, you know, had, what the experience was like for that individual. So that way you, you maintain some kind of record or, or database around what you, know, ex you experienced and that you can then present in a, if it were to go to a formal process. So I can coach a little bit around that to help clarify and, and support students with their documentation um, as to how, but, you know, Canvas, uh, emails, um, 
any of those things can also be useful. And or witness, there could be somebody that has gone with you who experienced the same thing or other students that have experienced the same thing or uh, were there at the same time. Hopefully I answered the question. I, I think so. Hanak wrote in the chat that he thanks you for the solutions and response. And Marcus has a question about the process for student complaints towards services like financial aid, registration, cashier, so non-class or instructor complaints that might be related when you were talking about the departmental complaints. Right? Yes. So again, you could always um, do formal and say, this is my experience. You still can submit documentation. Um, and again, you have the department, so that if it's a department, you have both the individual whose area. Um, so I'm trying to figure out um, breaking down if, and I can help or any of the um, uh, folks around other departments can help you figure out as an individual, who are the people responsible for that department? So that way you can address the issue with that, the head or the lead of that department who their supervisor is and if you want to continue informally to talk to the vice president uh so if it's an you know a departmental piece um as you said financial aid you could always talk to the dean of enrollment who is over the financial aid as the supervisor of that supervisor so there are administrative levels that you can reach uh to speak to someone that um, you can make aware of those departmental pieces. And again, I encourage you to use your student government, the, um, the executive officer administration meets regularly with the president. And so if there are issues and concerns, that executive officer can raise those to the administrator, um, executive administration, so they can present that to um, and there's, you know, the director of student leadership who supervises or advises the student government also will be hearing some of these and raise, we raise everything up uh, um, through the ranks to the VP of student services or VP of instruction uh, or deans of instruction. So you could always, once you know which department and who the people are responsible, you can address those. And if you feel that that's not being resolved, take it up further and let uh, administration uh, know that you know that issue is at hand and you could always file if, if those things are not finding a solution you could always file a formal complaint towards that department which will then um, put the director or supervisor of that area um, as the person responsible for that department to address those issues that's a good question that, that thank you marcus for that question it was great um so i have a related question, which is I noted in the definition beginning, it said student or students. And so when there's an issue with an institution or a department or something, would it be appropriate for multiple students to come together to write one complaint or engage in that process and provide their individual evidence, but all on one? Yes, the answer is absolutely. And that I, I've experienced that happen uh, in my tenure. Uh, uh, where more than one student can come and they've had similar experience and they come together, um, sort of a supportive, you know, team of, of two or more sometimes. Uh, I've had a couple of incidents um, where that has been the case. But yes, you can you could um, you can work with other students, especially if you find that you're sharing the same experience. Um, so student or students is literally that, that it could be a student or it could be more than one student who comes and files a complaint uh, collectively towards a department or individual, um, depending on the issue. Thank you. I think that's that, all we have in the chat for now. So. Awesome, good. So for your uh, information, we have a student handbook, um, which we got accreditation, gave us a, uh, what is it called? A, it was a kudos, I forget which of the terms it is, but um, which surprised the heck out of me because I had not been happy with, with our student handbook, but apparently we were doing good. But the student handbook, please, um, and uh, Dennis Student Leadership um, also uh, put it so that it's um, a web-based uh, student handbook. So kudos to Dennis for doing that. Um, so there are two 
ways in which you can access that. So if you do a search on our website, it'll, you know, do student handbook, you'll see the PDF is the one that usually comes up the quickest. But in the student leadership section of our um, web page, you'll also see um, the student um, handbook uh, in that format. Uh, page 29 has uh, begins the information with the details. So please um, seek it out um, and get familiar with the process, uh, but that's the reference to go to. Um, I'll send this out, this PowerPoint uh, to Kimberly so that she can post it. And I'll add the link to the actual um, RCW uh, so that you can also uh, see where the, the government's uh, link uh, and access to the information is. Um, so those are two resources for you on, on the how, uh, and we've been asking and, and where. So the, if there are other questions at this point. We do have another question. Okay, just a note that I put a link into the chat to the, to the WET code, and I also put the link to the library's page for this conversation. And on the left-hand side of that page, you can find the link to all of the college's student complaint process sites and the student web student handbook for Seattle Central. We have a couple of questions from Yvonne um, in the chat. And Yvonne is asking what the approximate timeline is to complete the formal complaint process. And when do students hear back about the outcome and from whom? Mm -hmm. um, faculty union um, contract wants it done in 20 days from the point that it's formal. Um, but that's tricky because if a complaint gets filed at the end of spring, we have to wait till fall to possibly address. Remember, faculty are not under contract during breaks and during the summer, unless they've got a you know, summer contract. Um, so that can slow things down, but there are timelines to everything. So once I receive a, a complaint, I have five days to to submit it to the faculty or staff. They then have 10 days to respond. I have five days to, to then forward that response to the, back to the student. So that if done within that period of time, you already have 20 days. So hopefully um, it gets resolved at that point. Uh, otherwise it becomes a little bit more difficult because if the student then requires or requests a conference, that also has to be done within a period of time. But, you know, depending on the time in which this begins, it could end up um, kind of being a little lengthy. And that's one of the things about the process. It's not a quick process uh, just because of calendar. And we're talking business days. We're not talking calendar days. Um, we don't work on the weekends, supposedly. <laughs> I laugh at that um, for other reasons. But anyway, uh, we we you know we have to, and then there are holidays, and as I said, there are breaks. So we try to get those things done as soon as possible. What was the other question? The other question, I think that was. If or oh no, the second question from Yvonne was when do students hear back about the outcome and from whom? So that you kind of talked about that in the timeline. Yes. Yeah. So I'm I'm the since I'm the officer uh, that has been designated, you'll be hearing from me. Um, I try to, you know, I'm I'm the one who's communicating back and forth with uh, between all parties involved. So that would be at Seattle Central at North, I believe. I think that that's Dr. Mari. Mari. Yeah. Mari yeah, yeah, Dr. Mari is. is Hi, the... sorry I'm late, but yes, it would be me. There she is <laughs> in all her glory. It's good to see you. And I'm not recalling the name of the person at South. Um, Dr. Dr. Dan Johnson. Okay. So depending on what campus you're at, that's who you'd be hearing back from. Yes. And Thank you, Kimberly. Absolutely. Um, Hamid, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, asked, can you talk a bit about filing a complaint at the state and federal level? Oh, good question. Um, I can't say much about it because I'm, I'm not, but students do if, um, and, you know, if a student has gone through our process 
in each of our campuses, students can still file a complaint within the state. So the Equal Opportunity Office, um, students can reach out to them and file a complaint um, still, uh, whether it's an issue of uh, access, do you have the, you know, the access um, department for, um, I forget the name of, of that department, but yes, students can, can keep going up in the state system. And that has happened uh, in the past where students will solicit um, other ways of addressing, um, finding some, you know, recourse. So, um, so yes, uh, the only thing is that I don't, I can, I can, um, EEOC is a good department, but they're, they will expect that you have gone through the process for each of the campuses, whether it's North, Central or South, or any of the system, uh, the community or technologists within the state. The idea is that you're gonna try to resolve it within, and if that doesn't happen, that then they will, you know, entertain your, your complaint. Um, but um, they wanna see that. And the other piece that keeping in mind that, um, and, and I forgot to mention this earlier, this process does not, um, remember that the flow chart, um, if there are issues that are HR related, this process will not fire anybody because that's not the intent of this. Um, and those are human resource issues. Um, I'm None of us are in, in my capacity um, able to, you know, we don't have that kind of power. And this process does not have that sort of power that, you know, it could be punitive to the extent in which somebody gets fired. Those issues are more human resource related or any of the other, um, and I can go back to that, um, to the to the complaints. Um, these, you know, if it's sexual harassment, verse, content, um, there are other departments, whether it's HR or the conduct department, um, or if, if it's, you know, uh, human resource or our, um, our uh, district office, um, I'm forgetting the title of that department, but they address issues of, you know, EDI or legal kinds of issues that might come. Um, the formal complaints process will refer those issues to those departments. So if I get something that is very much related to one of the other areas, I let them know. Here's this, and I will let the, the individual student know and say, this looks like it's a human resource issue that needs to go to them and I engage them and the student is aware. I sort of do the handoff so that the student is aware um, and they can then begin, if there's a need for an investigation, they can be the ones to do that. Thank you. We have another question from Dr. Commodore who's asking, does the student receive the final findings of the complaint automatically or do they have to file a public records request? No, uh, the individual will get, so once a, a uh, conference, if it's a, if it's a response from the staff or faculty about the initial complaint, they will receive a copy of that response and this, the individual student then needs to review and determine whether they're they're going to be satisfied or not. If they go to a conference, they choose to go on to a conference, holding a conference, I do a summary report of that conference and I will provide my recommendations around that. So the student is fully aware of what the results of that are. Um, so they know again, what the information is. If they're not satisfied with that and it goes to the VP, the VP also submits a letter at the end of their decision. So the student gets to hear that. And all of those bits of communication go directly to the student. Wonderful. Desiree has two great questions. Um, one is, what if a student does not feel safe filing a complaint? And the second is, are translators available in this process? Yeah, safety. And, and, and my question on the q and is, what would make this process better for you and your experience if you were to go through this? Uh, so be thinking about that and feel free to share that on, on chat or, or comment it on the chat. Um, this is the, the tricky part because this process is a transparent process, 
right? It, it's not an anonymous. It can't be an anonymous. If I have a complaint, let's say that I have a group of friends and one of them has an issue with me. I want that person to come to me and let me know what that issue is. I want to be able to have an opportunity to resolve, to find solution. That's what this process is trying to get at, is trying to find a solution. I do understand, and I hope sincerely that everybody involved understands that there are power differentials, right? If it's a staff or a faculty that the student has a complaint against, I fully understand that there's power um, positioning that those individuals may have, that the student may feel very vulnerable. And I would hope that a faculty understands that and that a staff understands that. But I also know that both faculty and staff oftentimes feel very vulnerable when a student comes and complains against them is filed. So either way, people are going to feel very unsafe and in a sense of uneasiness around this. So if we're working through this in good faith, then we need to acknowledge that and acknowledging that is an important piece. Um, retaliation, there's no room for it in, in our system. If that ever happens, we are very clear about, you know, putting a, a total stop to anything of that nature. Um, so uh, what I can say to a student who's feeling a little bit uneasy is that you could always bring a, a friend or somebody else, another. you can bring an advisor with, you can bring somebody, to help sort of make that easy or engage in the conversation. I'm happy if you give me, you know, the opportunity and you're concerned a little bit, I can have a conversation with the faculty and say, you know, the student is, is concerned about A, B, and C, is a little scared to connect with you. I'm coming as a way to make it a little easier for the student who is feeling this uh, to engage with you, you know, can, for FYI, what can we do to help the student be able to connect with you directly so that they can um, find some solution around this? I'm, I'm happy to, to do that as well as I know other um, staff are willing to do that um, in other areas. So um, making use of that. Thank you, Ricardo. These questions are coming in hot. So there was a second part to Desiree's question, which is, are translators available? And then we- Oh, that's right. And depending, yes, uh, and I'm not sure if, um, I know that um, we, if a student, and we've had, um, at any time there is a need for access services to jump in, I can always reach out to them uh, if I am aware. Um, and if we need a translator, um, we could always, I, I'm trying to remember when, I mean, I've spoken in Spanish to folks that have come to me and we've talked about this. Um, so if there's a need for it, yes, we will figure it out. We have to. Thank you. Um, this was kind of related to what you were, uh, Nicole is asking, how should students handle potential retaliation after a complaint? Uh, yeah, let us know. Uh, let the supervisor know. Let, you know, if retaliation is happening and you have, you know, you demonstrate it, saying this is what I'm experiencing. Yeah, we're on it. We can't, we don't tolerate it. Okay. Zero tolerance for retaliation, Thank zero. You. Um, another question is, can the supervisor and Dean have a meeting with the student together? Um, this person has noticed in the steps that it said they can go to one or the other. So you, yeah, so if you've gone to the, to the staff or faculty, and you want to have a conversation then with the dean of that department or supervisor of that department, you could always, yeah, you could definitely ask for, for a conversation between those two individuals. Um, absolutely. If it's, you know, I'm assuming that you're speaking from an informal process, it can definitely happen. In the formal process, you have the conference. So you will have an opportunity to do that. But yeah, in fact, I would welcome that if you as an individual student feel that a conversation with both the individual and their supervisor is warranted and it would be helpful, go for it, absolutely. Thank you, Ricardo. Another question on, are there, are there possibilities for training staff in building complaints? Um, so maybe a future session or development day or something? Yeah. 
up, up, write that one down. Yeah, Madi, you and I could do a little soft shoe around that one. I don't know if somebody would want to do that, but I would. Uh, <laughs> well, there's a request for it. So yeah. the desire is there. I think this person's noting that there are complexities that they have to navigate or consider before escalating beyond the instructor to student resolution. So mm -hmm. there's a, a need and a desire. Okay. Um, people are noting the very real concern of retaliation. And then another request, uh, how do we handle a complaint that doesn't involve us? So if there's an employee that's constantly belittling the BIPOC employees underneath them and doing so in front of students. Yeah. So um, I think that informally, start there. Um, that if somebody's observing and experiencing, there are two things you can do, and I'll go back to this um, other piece. There is a bias incident report that you can file that is through, uh, in our area, I think that South also has a burst, and I think North does too. Mari, are you aware of your burst process? It, it would be going through DeAndre Fisher. Yeah. yeah, so, um, and for us is our EDI office as well. So um, BURST is a bias incident report. Um, if you see a bias incident, you can file, even if it's not you who's um, directly um, affected by it. You could also informally contact the supervisor of that individual. Um, so that will be, an you know, sort of down here with this uh, conversation. And, you know, um, we talk a little bit about um, stopping issues, right? And how do we, uh, as bystanders, can, can support a process. You as an individual can have a very um, freeing, I would say, because it's, you know, you could you can go to that person and, and say to them, you know, this is what I've experienced, um, and I'm just letting you know what my experience is. Uh, so it is possible that as a bystander, you could also interrupt a system that has taken place. Um, so that's a possibility. Uh, it take it's it takes skill and ability to do that, uh, but that is out there and you can. But you could also con connect with their supervisor. Ooh, we have another question, but I just want to quickly recognize that we're technically at the end Hi. of the time. So I want us to thank Ricardo. Um, and so Ricardo's going to be sending me the links to this slide and I will be posting it on the COSI website. That link is in the chat and I can throw it in there again. But please join me in thanking him for this incredible session. And it's very informative, I think, for a Yeah. Lot of and thank you, Mari, for jumping in too. I'm glad that you were able I to wasn't that this. helpful, but I am so glad that you did this. Oh, oh no. It's needed. Your, information yeah, is needed. Yeah, your face and your presence is especially important to have. So thank you, Kimberly, for your opportunity and for the, and now there's an evaluation. Yes. Um, so I'm going to post that link in the chat where the slides will be posted and the, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one, where the slides will be posted and where the session recording will be posted. Um, we had one more question, if you have time, Ricardo. Sure. Okay. And that question was from Bryce, do you know who will be taking up the uh, bias incidents reporting pieces with the removal of EDI leadership from the campuses? Um, and so will that be going to the district now? Um, good question. And I don't know that I have the answer, but I, I would say that the EDI will still, because every all of the campuses will still have uh, staff in, in their ID, EDI. Um, so there's representation in each of the campuses of an EDI that, that will, you know, indirectly or directly report to the district wide. Um, but still connect with the um, with the EDI. And there's a committee uh, and in our campus, I know, Bryce, we have a group of people that review those bursts. So it's not just our um, um, EDI um, associate vice president who would be in charge of that. Um, so I would say, I don't have the answer. Good question. And I would still connect with the office of 
EDI in each of the campuses because they're still active within. Mari, any other thoughts around that one that you know? Um, I agree that it's still going to be through the EDI office, whatever structure that we would have, if it's going to be an AD or a director, um, it would still go through there, that department. So start there. And you can always still start with us and then we'll help find yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now.